Hi everyone, it's Alex, and today I'm here to review Cleanness by Garth Greenwell, which tells a story as old as time about sad gay men. This is a story set in Bulgaria as an American English teacher reminisces or actively experiences sexual encounters with fellow men. While we do follow the same protagonist throughout the book, the chapters in the book are meant to stand alone as their own solidified, self-contained stories. Immediately, the first story, called Mentor, immediately establishes establishes just how far and separate our protagonist is involved with sort of coming to terms with his own sexual identity. While having one of his male students confess to our protagonist that he has a crush on another boy, the student tries to capture his own desire by simply saying that maybe if I just kiss this boy, that would be enough. Our protagonist softly disagrees with his student about this claim, thus foreshadowing his own experiences throughout the rest of the book. So it's nice that Cleanness doesn't try to attempt to tell a story about the fragile molding of early sexual identity. And it's really interesting because I think with this first chapter, which I think is the strongest from pretty much the whole book, also considers just how much his student could teach him about what it means to be a modern gay man. But on the other hand, I truly don't think that Cleanness tries to bother with telling anything more challenging or more significant other than from a part our protagonist's own experience. Unless the challenge is supposed to be the protagonist not realizing his own aloofness towards his own awful personality. The title Cleanness is named after this singular and implied rare moment where the protagonist experiences this shape of desire that he's really confused by where his current lover simply smiles at him. So the other sexual encounters that the protagonist experiences with other men feels like a moment of trying to mimic this same feeling of specialness that he hopes to see in someone else. He does this by often going against the violence already associated with his existing sexual behavior in favor of more soft gestures of intimacy, but it often leaves his partners feeling and confused and deflated. Realizing that his sense of generosity isn't really working to where he tries to see something special in his sexual partners, instead he begins defining what his partners in the moment feel is pleasurable versus not pleasurable, even if readers don't get access to that verbal consensual confirmation. Unbeknownst to his sexual partners, the protagonist seems to live in this imaginary purgatory where night feels infinite and boys in online chat rooms are just waiting for his affection. This displacement of his well-intended generosity, I think, is due to the protagonist thinking he's having sex with two different kinds of people. The first person is who he often thinks his sexual partner is like based on their online profile and their own sense of what he commonly refers to as their performance. And the second person is how he himself would emulate the behavior of someone he would want to have sex with. And to this second type of person that I mentioned, it seems pretty evident based on what our protagonist says. I wanted to kiss him, to be in a different kind of scene with him, but of course I couldn't change the scene. It would have been a breach of our contract. If it had been my usual role to dominate, to be cruel, to be cruel in that way, my role or my nature, I would have simply acted on my inclination, I think. At least that's what I imagine it must be to act as the men I long for act. To want something and not question it. On top of all of this, there is this layer that I mention again about this idea of what it means to feel cleanness or to see something special in someone. So whether or not the protagonist can see something special in his current sexual partner, he's also hoping that they see something in him that makes them essentially want to fall in love with him the way that he fell in love with an old lover. And if they don't reciprocate, it's then when our protagonist feels like he has to be in the most control, often being the instigator of more escalated sexual advances. Regarding thoughts on his former lover that I just mentioned, which also happened to be the longest relationship he was in, our protagonist says, I laughed with him, even as I sensed, just past the edges of what we felt, a hovering dread. It was a habit of mine to rush toward an ending once I thought I could see it, as if the fact of loss were easier to bear than the chance of it. I didn't want that to happen with R. I struggled against it. He was worth struggling for, I thought, as was the person I found I was with him. I would normally find sentiments like this to be sweet and romantic, but I feel like with our protagonist in this book, his declarations never really carry any weight because I feel like there's consistently 
no continuity or energy to them. And that's because I can confidently say that this is a character in literature that I've encountered that I feel like is one of the most that's devoid of any sense of self-evaluation or self-awareness, which to me is even more shocking given the first-person perspective that the reader's given. Instead, to me, cleanness is riddled with empty moodiness. Garth Greenwell struggles with how he's able to expand his character without having sex take the spotlight. And strangely enough, I think it is these sex scenes that do allow the most sort of thinking and interestingness going on, um, not because of the physical, but just because our character, he is someone I believe that is someone that's emotionally intelligent and can comprehend how self-evaluation is so necessary and communicating with people and developing these types of relationships. But again, this evasiveness of the protagonist not really wanting to look inwardly. It's clear as day as a quote from early within the book that says, I had felt it before too. When he spat on me, it was like the spark along the track of my spine. Who knows why we take pleasure in such things? Maybe it's best not to look into it too closely. Claims like this and cleanness are so frequent that it causes me to clarify that everything I've mentioned previously regarding the protagonist's motives and sex life is complete speculation. Even beyond the story or lack thereof and cleanness, I've never read a book that's left me so unprepared, even after 200 pages, to really even get a sense or know what I read about or even realize who I'm reading about. In other areas like setting, Bulgaria feels more accommodating than alive, and the character R that I mentioned earlier just feels like a complete soundboard for the protagonist to bounce off of. Unfortunately, cleanness remained to me, blissfully unaware of how its protagonist became its own bystander in his own story. Having our protagonist say soft core, deep gibberish, like, I went out in search of feeling, I suppose, or maybe the absence of feeling. If I seem harsh or hostile in this review, it's because I'm honestly dumbfounded at what cleanness is achieving in the literary canon, especially the gay literary landscape, no less. I think when a writer writes towards specific themes like this, it does doesn't need to relate to every reader, obviously, but I do think it's a book's responsibility to challenge its existing or ancestor contemporaries on why these themes are still necessary. In this case, other than the protagonist and cleanness going through a sex-binged stupor, with unenlightening revelations that leave readers like me scrapping to salvage meaning, I'm left with a story that chooses to stiffen the nuance on yearning and desire across gay men, and tops it all off with a truly lazy ending with a dog metaphor. Of course, if you read Cleanness, I would love to know what you think, um, especially more positive things, because maybe truly I just missed something and I didn't catch it. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.